This is the Digital Music Trends coverage of South by Southwest 2014, an interview with Paul Fackler, partner at Arant Fox LLP. DMT's coverage of South by Southwest is brought to you by Omniphone, the leading B2B cloud music provider powering global music services including Sony Music Unlimited, Guvera, Rara and Sirius XM. Find out more on Omniphone.com and by Music Graph, the world's first knowledge engine for music, available as a consumer app and as a graph API for developers. Check out MusicGraph.com or Developer.MusicGraph.com. Hello everyone and welcome to the Digital Music Trends coverage of South by Southwest 2014 and it's a real pleasure today to be here with Paul uh, Fackler, a partner at uh, uh, Aaron Fox LLP. So hi Paul and thanks for joining me, how's it going? Uh, fantastic Andre, a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great. And so uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, your session that you had here at South by and some of the core issues that uh, you found uh, uh, that you're finding for, for this year for, for digital music and music copyright. So first of all, what was the session about here at South by Southwest? So, the uh, fundamental premise of uh, the presentation that I gave as uh, someone who's been working in the digital music space for about 15 years, since really the, the, the very beginning of it, is that now that we're 15 years into the existence of the streaming digital music streaming service market, and we're at a point where not a single uh, player, not a single service has ever turned a profit on an annual basis, much less on a cumulative basis. I think it's it's very clear that the rates, the, the, the overall royalty burden that these services pay is unsustainable. It's been unsustainable and it continues to be unsustainable. So part of what I talked about in my presentation was uh, a little of the history, because a lot of the people who are talking about these issues or are thinking about these issues, I don't seem to know all of the history of it. And right. it's, it's to understand where we are and where we're going. Uh, I'm a firm believer you got to first understand how we got here. Yeah, right? sure. Uh, so, so it all starts with the court, uh, rate courts, right? It all starts and the alpha and the omega of all of the problems are the rate courts, uh, particularly on the sound recording side. Yeah. Um, so uh, I gave a little overview of how particularly the, uh, well, uh, as a starting point, if you look at streaming services overall, uh, they're paying somewhere between typically 55 to 75 percent of their gross revenue in royalties yeah. for the music. Okay, it's hard to know. You know, be very precise because uh, on the sound recording side, the royalties are paid per play instead yeah. of our percentage of revenue, at least right now. Uh, and a lot of the companies are not public, and a lot of the companies only were in business for a couple of months before they went out under yeah. these burdens. Uh, but if you would look at the companies that are public or were public for a while, and if you look at the press reporting and, and things like that, you can figure out and do the math. It's it's some usually most services are in that range of 55 to 75. Although some interactive services have paid even higher than that yeah. uh, in particular periods. Uh, so uh, most of that royalty goes to the record companies. Okay, the the rates for the sound recording rights are much higher than they are for the music publishing oh, yeah. rights. Okay, uh, and the bottom line is, uh, you know, that's because of the way that the sound recording rights were set before the Copyright Royalty Board. Yeah. And I went through. There were a series of benchmarks. So when you and I litigate these rate cases, so it's a very arcane area of the copyright law, uh, and it's not for the faint of heart. I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, but you know, one of the key issues that drives really the most single most important issue that drives where the rates get set, and it even explains. Uh, sometimes you hear a discussion about uh, a concepts, they call it platform parity or things like that, where there are certain services that pay at different rates than yeah. other services, like satellite and cable radio pay lower rates than webcasters, for example. Um, the key driver of those differences are the benchmark agreements that the Copyright Royalty Board use as the starting point yeah. to set the rate. So. Uh, a series of very bad decisions coming out of the Copyright Royalty Board where every five years these proceedings happen where the rates get adjusted. Yeah. Uh, every five years the rates have gone up <laughs> and uh, they started very high and they just went up from there and always based on these uh, uh, benchmarks that were used. So um, if I'm right that the current rates are unsustainable, uh, then I sort of transitioned into a discussion of some key issues uh, that have come up in 2014 that are, presumably will be resolved in this year and over the next couple of years that uh, pose a threat to send the rates potentially even higher. 
yeah. for digital music services. And of course, it's my thesis that, uh, you know, this is disastrous. Yeah, right? so so essentially, you know, where we're at right now is that the uh, sound recording, the, the master uh, uh, rates are pretty high, uh, especially compared to publishing. The publishers want to up those rates on the publishing side and the master uh, owners, of course, don't want those rates to diminish. So if the, if the publisher has got uh, uh, to have a co comparable rate to the master, Owners that would essentially almost double the rates that are currently right now. So, right, which means that the royalties payable would be, <laughs> would be over even 100%. more unsustainable. Yes. Well, I, you know, nobody can pay more than 100 percent of their gross revenue, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, so it's uh, it's a difficult situation to be in. It is a difficult situation, and it's ironic because if you understand the history of how the rates were set for the sound recordings. One of the reasons that the rates were able to be set that high in the Copyright Royalty Board was expressly because the judges agreed with the record label's argument that the sound recording performance right is inherently much more valuable than the musical composition right, right? right? Because in the first digital music, mu when, when the first digital music services ever, right, were these cable radio services. They launched in the late 80s. Yeah. And they were their their launch and and their their existence is what led initially to in the United States for the first time there even being a public performance right for sound recordings. Unlike the rest of the world, you know, the U.S. didn't recognize a copyright or a neighboring right or any other sort of federal right for sound recordings for the first hundred years of the existence of the record companies. Yeah. Right. So uh, in the first proceeding to set these uh, uh, rates for digital cable at the time. The CARP, which was the predecessor entity to the copyright royalty judges, uh, but they basically did the same thing. They used the musical publishing rights, the PRO rates, right. ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, as the benchmark to set the sound recording rates. And they said, look, they're, they're inherently in a, in a non-interactive situation where you're right. not uh, substituting for the sale of records, the core business of the record companies, and it's really a discovery vehicle and all of these other things, right? There's no inherent reason to think that the rights to the publishing are worth, you know, different, you know, any more or less yeah. sound recording as a starting point. And that's why I think is usually 50-50, right? That is correct, because it's an ancillary revenue stream. And and when you're the, the entity who, who is trying to acquire the rights to play the sound recording, the, those are two copyrights that are just bundled together. They're wound up. You can't, neither one is, is usable without the other, right? So there are a lot of reasons uh, why... Uh, and, and in fact, there are rate courts, rate tribunals in the UK and in Canada yeah, sure. who set tariff rates for similar rights and yeah. have been doing so for a long time. And in the UK, apparently, they're even higher for internal radios, which makes uh, S Pandora, for example, uh, withdrew from the from the UK and hasn't uh, launched uh, again. <laughs> that is very true. I mean, look, there is a lot of messes involved with the European, you know, with the rights situation in Europe. Um, but what's interesting about that is putting aside the level of the rates, the relative rates for the sound recording and the musical compositions are considered equal, yeah. equivalent, okay? And in the rate decisions, the, the, the tribunals that set the rates always say, starting, and in fact, when they're litigating rates in these other countries, even the record labels and the uh, music publishers have agreed that yeah. the rates are, it's only in the United States where they've run this jive down, right? In the original, you know, once the first webcasting proceeding, because that's what happened. So the judges in the first digital music proceeding, they bought that. They said the rates should be equivalent. They, they rejected, RAAA argued specifically, well, sound recordings are inherently worth more, all this other stuff. Yeah. They rejected those arguments, and they, in fact, they set the sound recording license rate lower than the PRO rate in that proceeding. By the time that that proceeding was done with all the appeals and such, the first webcasting CARP be had begun. Right. And under the old CARP system, you every time there was a different proceeding, they would get three different ar new arbitrators to, to hear the case. And in that proceeding, they just reversed course. They said, All no, right. we're going to reject the PRO benchmark, yeah. and we're going to go with this wonderful, there was only one ultimately benchmark agreement left standing, and it, right. it was an agreement between Yahoo and, and RAAA that was horribly flawed. And that is ultimately what led to the rates being so much higher. So, so the irony is, the only reason the rates went higher for webcasters is that the, the CARP and then the, the Copper Early Board accepted the argument that the sound recording rates should be a vast multiple of the musical composition rates. Yeah. But now the publishers want to argue they should be equal, which is completely inconsistent with why 
the sound recording rates are so high. Yeah. And I, I, I guess it's a difficult debate to have because uh, uh, I know I understand artists uh, wanted to make as much money as possible, and, and, and you know labels, of course, and not just artists, uh, mostly labels, wanted to make as much money as possible out of the sound recordings. Uh, but do you think that in the long run, if there was a, a, a slight lowering the rating that made services more sustainable, that would lead to a healthier ecosystem overall? There's no question because look, the, these businesses, no, like I said, no business, none of these businesses have ever made a profit on an annual basis, right? Uh, every once in a while, one will have a quarter, a quarter right? yeah, like, it's but like, it's hey. meaningless. And, you know, all the financial <laughs> advisors jump up and down and cheer. And they, the stock goes up. <laughs> right. Just, exactly. That's why they're cheering, right? Because it's always been an equity play for these yeah. companies, right? Whether it's going public or whether it's flipping the company, right? Uh, that has been what's been driving uh, uh, the businesses. And that doesn't make for a healthy system for consumers, uh, yeah. for artists or anything else. Yeah. And, and if these services go out of business, that money is not going to th th is going to be lost to the record companies and the artists and the and the songwriters and the music publishers. It's not like record sales are going to go up. Yeah. If these streaming services go out of business, it's just not going to happen. And so let's talk about uh, the uh, current rate uh, issues that are happening uh, with ASCAP BMI and the digital rights. So that's a uh, that's a whole mess that I've been following for the last year or so. It's quite it's quite hard to explain because uh, you know I have quite a, a, a wide uh, audience and uh, I try to make sure that that. That's an issue that is understandable, but uh, essentially we have an ongoing, two ongoing processes now going on in New York. Uh, one with ASCAP and one with BMI, which have to do with uh, uh, rates, but also have to do with whether those companies are able to withdraw their, uh, some publishers are able to withdraw their digital rights uh, from those organizations without uh, uh, falling foul of the consent decree that was assigned uh, uh, that, that a long time ago, I guess. Uh, so uh, on that front, uh, you know, what are the latest developments? Uh, it's a very complicated issue but if you if you can explain it to us in a in a simple way that would be fantastic <laughs> well, I, give it, I will give it a whirl okay um and in the simplest terms it all just as all of these issues do it comes down to money right so as i was just discussing over the years the the music publishing rates um the, the ascap and bmi and and csac you know the performing rights for musical compositions those rates have been relatively low okay for you have a long period of time where terrestrial radio you know has been paying those for many years they're paying in the low single digits i think right now they're paying around three and a half percent of revenue um for for the pro rights the digital services when they came on uh the ascap and bmi were able to get slightly higher rates out of the digital services but because of the rate court they weren't able to just come in and because of this history of terrestrial radio you know it's uh, they weren't able to get extremely high rates. So the, the digital services pay somewhere in the 5% of revenue yeah. for non-interactive digital music services, right? Uh, so, uh, and it's interesting, these rate courts that you were just discussing, and this is one of the key differences between the way rates are set on the sound recording side and the music publishing yeah. side. Uh, the, uh, the rate courts for the music publishers came out of these antitrust consent decrees that you were just discussing, right? And so there's this underlying understanding and they're set by federal judges who are very familiar with antitrust law, issues of competition, competitive markets. They're very uh, familiar with economic analyses, things like that. And, and so they have a starting point of, because of the consent decrees being essentially antitrust rulings, they come into rate court very concerned with making sure that the benchmarks used, that the rates are approximate rates that would occur in a competitive marketplace, which doesn't exist for music licensing. It's very important to understand this, that there's no such thing as a true competitive market because the rights that you have to acquire as a music service don't substitute for one another. So it's not a question of, oh, if ASCAP gives me a better rate, I'm going to go with ASCAP and not get a BMI license. You have to get all three of them because copyrights are not fungible. The, the music is not fungible. And, and uh, you know, so the rate court uh, has over time, every time the labels have gone in and tried to jack up the rates for the digital music services, the rate courts have said, you know, hold your horses, that's not going to happen. We're going to keep them nice and stable. Yeah. So, in the, on the other side, with the sound recordings, the music publishers have watched the record companies go to the Copyright Royalty Board. Yeah. The Copyright Royalty Board, because it's not the product of an antitrust consent decree, but really uh, is a product of the Copyright Act itself, 
my view, having litigated in, the, in these cases and certainly read all of the decisions that have come out, at least under the original set of three judges, it was very clear that they were not interested in doing any searching analysis of whether the marketplace was competitive and when benchmarks were introduced, whether there was undue market power that explained high rates that were in some of these direct licenses that were used as benchmarks. Uh, so uh, that was the difference. Now the music publishers are watching every five years, the sound recording rates are getting higher and higher. The music publishing rates are staying lower. And you know, understandably from a business, purely short-term business perspective at least, they don't like that. Their answer, of course, is not to lower the sound recording rates to eliminate that disparity, yeah. which I would argue is the only rational thing you can do. Their argument is to raise the publishing rates. Yeah. The problem is, as I said, the rate court wasn't allowing them to do that that well. So they came up with a, uh, their only way to do this was to get out from under the rate court. And they've been pretty transparent about this in their public, uh, you know, the music publishers, uh, BMI and, and ASCAP, when they've made public statements about this, um, they came up with this idea that some of the major publishers to change the rules, the membership rules for ASCAP and BMI, so that they could do what, I'm, what I would call selective withdrawals. So they could withdraw their music from the ASCAP and BMI repertories, but only for certain types of licensees. They want to keep their music in ASCAP and BMI. For because it makes them money? <laughs> but, well, not only does it make them money, yeah. but it, there, there are huge benefits to everybody yeah. from ASCAP and BMI, okay? Uh, the, the blanket licenses, you know, for, for licensees, obviously it means you don't have to go around to a, a thousand different copyright owners, you know, and negotiate licenses. But it's even more beneficial for the copyright owners because, you know, Sony EMI does not want to hire uh, you know, they're firing people, they're condensing, they're certainly not job creators at this yeah. point, right? <laughs> they're, jo they're job eliminators, right, to maintain their profitability. So Marty Bandier can keep smoking those big cigars that he loves to carry in all of the pictures when he's on the cover of Billboard and, you know, all, all of that. Uh, so uh, the, 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 uh, if you if if you have, uh, and Sony uh, EMI was one of the, the first to really start pushing for this process. Yeah. So the idea is, uh, you know, the, Sony EMI doesn't want to be in the business of going out to every bar, restaurant, uh, you know, negotiating with terrestrial radio, yeah. with television. This this is a lot of work, and it would take a lot of people to replicate what EMI, uh, what ASCAP, I'm sorry, and BMI do very efficiently. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, that's why it has to be this partial withdrawal. But at the same time, uh, the partial withdrawal would also be uh, impact negatively on uh, smaller publishers and independent artists that are with ASCAP and BMI because it lowers their bargaining power when it comes to doing the same thing, right? Exactly right. Because if it, the purpose of the selective withdrawal, of course, is so that for the digital services, they now have to go and get direct licenses from the major music publishers. Because, as I mentioned before, similar to with the record companies, these copyrights are not in competition. There's no co competition in that market. The, the copyright owners enjoy absolute pricing power. The market power, and this gets back into the whole reason for the consent decrees and the antitrust concerns, they can demand any rates they want because you're, you have no other choice. You have to pay what they want or go out of business. So uh, right now, uh, what I'm seeing are three potential outcomes. So number one, uh, the c copyright owners uh, win. Uh, completely and the rates get uh, sent up and uh, publishers cannot withdraw the digital rights. Number two is that uh, the pub big publishers are allowed to withdraw digital rights and do direct licenses. Uh, number three is that uh, they come out to some sort of agreement to uh, lower somewhat the, the, the general uh, well, lower, actually. No, I, I don't know what the third option would be, actually. It's kind of, <laughs> I was trying to, to rationalize this, but it's uh, like I'm trying to figure out a, a scenario where the big publishers would stay with uh, uh, ASCAP and BMI and be happy with that deal instead of having to be uh, uh, made to stay uh, by a court. Well, they're never going to be happy with the deal, right? right. Because they're not, they, they, they've made it very they have clear. All the good, they have all the good tracks. They have <laughs> the big right. tracks. <laughs> I, I mean, the only thing that will make them happy is when they're also getting 50% of revenue. So the services are paying 50% to the record companies and 50% to them, right? Which is very short-sighted because everybody will be out of business. Yeah. Um, but what happened, uh, oddly, the, the wrinkle that happened in the, in the ASCAP and BMI, the Pandora cases, where this issue finally came uh, up to the judges and they had to rule on it, uh, in the ASCAP court, Judge Cote decided that that attempt to selectively withdraw uh, 
violated the consent decree, so it was ineffective, with the result that all of the uh, pu withdrawing publishers' music is still in the ASCAP repertory. Yeah. Th but then, a month or so later, in the BMI court, Judge Stanton agreed that it violated the consent decree, but he then said the consequence of w that was he was essentially rewriting the withdrawals so that they effectively withdrew for entirely so that yeah. all of the withdrawing publishers music was now out of the BMI repertory for any new licenses that came up. That was not, as we discussed before, what the publishers had in mind, yeah. right? right? So this happened right before Christmas. A few months of chaos ensued and m almost all of the withdrawing publishers have already now returned to, to BMI, yeah. right? In the interim. So what happens now, right? Um, First of all, there will obviously be an appeal to the Second Circuit of both of those decisions. I, I don't think there's any question that the Second Circuit is going to affirm that those partial withdrawals violate the consent decree. I right. don't think there's almost no chance that ASCAP or BMI will prevail on appeal on those issues. Um, however, what ASCAP and BMI have announced is, you know, they're currently negotiating with the Department of Justice to try to get the consent decree changed right. to allow this. So now we're talking about lobbying right? Behind the scenes, closed doors, smoky rooms, yep. all that good stuff. <laughs> They're also lobbying from what they say to get the consent decrees gotten rid of entirely, right? So there'd be no rate court for anything anymore, which they would love to have happen, right? Because right. no, then they can exercise all of that market power. Um, one interesting development just from last week that calls into question how successful they might be. We haven't been talking about CSAC, the third PRO here in, in the United States, right? The, because they don't have a consent decree and they're historical. I mean, they've always been much smaller. And back in the 1940s, 1950s, when these consent decrees went into place and rate courts were developed, uh, CSAC, the type of music that they uh, controlled, was not as commercially relevant. That's right. changed significantly over the years. While they're still a much smaller catalog, they have some key songwriters. So you always have to get a CSAC license, right? Um, Oh, CSAC actually have rights themselves. I didn't even know that. Oh, oh well, they're they're like ASCAP and BMI. They they yeah. they represent. Oh, CSAC. Sorry, yeah. CSAC. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thought... No, not CSAC. Right. Oh, okay, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Other, okay, yeah. Right. Right. Like the alphabet soup. <laughs> with an S. Yeah, yeah. With, right. Perfect. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'm with you now. <laughs> got it. So uh, so what has happened is uh, there have been two civil antitrust lawsuits filed yeah. against CSAC here in the United States uh, by the radio uh, negotiating committee and the television negotiating committee. And just a couple of weeks ago, uh, in the television case in the Southern District of New York, where it's pending, CSEC made a summary judgment motion, a motion to just get rid of the case after discovery, saying there were no antitrust claims. The judge rejected that motion. He held that the plaintiffs had adduced sufficient evidence that a jury could find antitrust violations right. in the blanket licensing, uh, and it's now going to have to go to trial. So the interesting question in this whole dynamic is, if in fact CSAC, the much smaller PRO, winds up subject to some sort of rate court oversight, how successful are ASCAP and BMI, the much bigger ones, going to be in arguing we don't need rate courts anymore? Right. So those are those are the questions, and I think <laughs> we're just going to have to wait and see. I mean, I'm certainly hopeful that you know uh, things work out such that you know everybody stays in ASCAP and BMI, we continue to have rate court oversight, because if those rates go up the way that the publishers will push them up, if they are, if, if services have to direct license them, uh, everybody's out of business. It's right. gone. Well, Paul, this was uh, super fascinating. And, uh, you know, where can people find out? Uh, do you have a website where you have some uh, some bits and bobs about about this, uh, this these latest developments? I, I do from time to time. I have a blog at uh, title17.net. Um, also, uh, from time to time, I publish on my firm's website on the right. Errant Fox uh, website, which you can find at errantfox.com. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's something I never get tired of talking about, as you That's might have awesome. uh, <laughs> seen. You may have to edit this down considerably. No, 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 you know. <laughs> YouTube is good. Is good for that. <laughs> you can uh, put well, anything up. You know, one other thing I'll throw in, and, sure. uh, uh, just in case. Uh, quickly, you're interested, because it's something that's not getting a lot of coverage, yeah. but also has is a huge potential minefield, is the problem here in the United States of pre-1972 sound recordings. Right. Okay? So the, the bottom line is, because of the way that the sound recording copyright developed here in the United States, where I mentioned for the first hundred years there wasn't any, yeah. 
it, when they finally created a sound recording copyright, they only made it prospective, not retrospective, right? So it only applies to sound recordings that were created after February 15, on 1972, a on the federal level. Yeah. Pre-1972 sound recordings are protected, if at all, by a patchwork of state laws, right? But those state laws have always been construed as being essentially anti-piracy laws, right. okay? So to prevent uh, parties from just making rip-off copies of sound recordings and selling them in competition with the record companies, there's never been a ruling that there's there's a public performance right. Sure. Because think about it, if there were, terrestrial radio has been infringing for a hundred years, yeah. right? So, uh, however, now the digital companies always get special treatment, right? So Sirius XM has five lawsuits pending right now against it, okay? The RAAA sued it, claiming it's infringing because, bec I should say, because they're not covered by federal copyright, they're also not included in the compulsory license, the statute and the Copyright yeah. Act, okay? That's what creates this problem. So RAAA has sued Sirius XM Sound Exchange has sued Sirius XM for not paying for these recordings under the compulsory license, even though it's not covered. So it's, you know, heads we win, tails you lose, which it always is with the record companies. Yeah. And then there are three class actions that have been filed in California, New York, and Florida uh, in the nominative plane of his uh, 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 Flo and Eddie of the Turtles. But yeah. in any event, you have these cases, and it's a huge problem. I, I predict it's going to be as big of a problem for the record companies as it is for the services, though. They've opened a can of worms. Uh, because the way it works is, if you take an old uh, 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 an album that was released prior to 1972, and you uh, merely digitize it, okay? So even when it, when it was time to, to release CDs in the yeah. 80s, right? If you just put it out on CD and you remastered it digitally, without changing, remixing it, or changing any of the EQ, or doing anything to it, it's still a pre-72 sound recording. But yeah. if you do any of those things, if you go back to the multi-track masters and do a remix, if you, uh, you know, Remaster if you, it, re yeah. well, if you EQ it, if you do something so it sounds in any way different, you've created a whole new copyright. Yeah. And in fact, back when the CDs first came out, the record companies would routinely register the copyrights as new copyrights yeah. claiming that they remixed these albums even when in a lot of instances they hadn't precisely because they wanted to claim federal copyright in these old recordings the only way to tell whether a sound recording in the digital world some file that they get served by the record companies you know to put on these services is truly in a copyright sense pre-72 or post-72 is to get an old copy of the vinyl yeah load it you know digitize it and then do a spectral analysis a waveform analysis there's ways of doing it and i've done it in litigation when i was dealing with a small number of recordings and we were arguing over they were pre-72 or not um i can guarantee you the record companies don't even know which of their recordings you know the digital files are truly pre-72 post-72 for the digital music services there's no way for them to tell it's a right. it's an impossible trap so uh, uh, this is going to be, a, when you hear the, the parties arguing about this, they all talk about, well, the album was released before 7. That does not give you the answer under the copyright law. So once these all finally get litigated, this is going to be a huge mess. <laughs> and what's the end game, right? That's yeah. the question. What's the end game? Because if the record companies were right, and, and there is the state law performance right, they have the ability to put any music service that uses the compulsory license, the non-interactive services, right. out of business. Because they've all, nobody, I'm not aware of any digital music service that uses the compulsory license that has separate direct licenses for pre-72. Sure. On the other hand, if they don't choose not to put them out of business and they just, are they going to offer a license? And if so, does that 55 to 75% of revenue now go up because there's a whole <laughs> new license that you have to get, right? So. That's another little tidbit that not a lot of folks are talking about and thinking Absolutely. about, but yeah. um, it's an important one. <laughs> uh, Paul, thanks so much for your time. It was a real pleasure talking to you today. The pleasure is mine, Andrea. And thanks for watching the DMT coverage of South by Southwest. You can find out everything on digitalmusictrends.com or on youtube.com slash digitalmusictrends.